<laughs> so next, I want to uh, introduce a very important person to PodCamp Pittsburgh. <laughs> Uh, Justin, he's our founding uh, member of the, the founder of PodCamp Pittsburgh. Uh, so thank you, and Justin, welcome. Thanks. Welcome back. That's me. Uh, hey, folks. This is kind of overwhelming, honestly. Um, I wanted to get up here and talk about expectations, and mine were just blown away as I walked into this room today. Uh, this is the fourth PodCamp Pittsburgh which is cool, uh, and it's not the fourth PodCamp ever, because PodCamp is a nationwide and international event. It started in Boston, where they thought, well, let's get together a bunch of people who like to do web audio and web video, and they can teach each other. We'll probably get like, a couple dozen people. And they got 300-something people at that first event, and they said, wow, there's a lot more of an audience for this than we thought. Why don't you who are here take it back to where you're from, try it in your local area, and see you know, what is your audience like? What is what are your local uh, web content creators have to teach each other. And so we tried it here in Pittsburgh three years ago. This is the fourth one, three years. And uh, I thought there'd be a couple dozen people at ours, and we had 180, so not too bad. It's grown to 500 and counting this year, which is where the overwhelming part comes in, because if you expected to get more than one piece of food at lunch, you're probably out of it. <laughs> sorry. Um, but everybody came in here with expectations today. You know, I expected to meet old friends and make some new ones. And a lot of folks who are here for the first time, actually, how many folks are here at a pod camp for the first time? Holy cow. <laughs> Has anybody been to a pod camp before? Anyone? Okay, all right, okay, okay. Good. So, uh, the people who just put their hands up, you will be getting asked a lot of questions by the people who had their hands up 10 seconds ago, so get ready. Um, PodCamp is sort of a peer education system, which means those of us who think we know something get up here and tell those of you who think we know something uh, what we know. So everybody comes in here with questions, and not everybody that you're going to talk to is going to have all the answers. So the beauty of PodCamp is that every conversation you have is going to be relevant to you in some way. And a couple years ago, John Carmen, who's going to be moderating one of our uh, debates later today, get ready, uh, he had an interesting point of view. He said, you know, sometimes I'm having a conversation at PodCamp, it's with somebody else who does what I do, or does something that I'm interested in, and it's sort of mind-blowing, because they have all these cool insights, and then I have questions they hadn't thought of, and it's sort of like there's this electricity that goes on in the conversation, and you just had that magic, and you turn around, and the next guy asks you, like, what is a blog? I've, I've heard of. And so all of a sudden, your mind has to downshift from being a peer, being, you know, uh, teaching each other to realizing that, wow, I know a little more than this person does at this stage, so I've got to, you know, reconvert my way of thinking and help this person out. But by doing that, I'm reinforcing what I already know about the subject. I'm thinking about it in a new way so I can present it to somebody else, and they're going to take that information and share it with somebody else. So it's a benefit to me anyway, even though I'm not really, quote unquote, learning anything from this conversation, I should still be going through the process of reteaching myself, you know, how to phrase things, what do I know? What is important to this person that they've come here to find out? So everybody in this room came here expecting to learn something and hopefully uh, wanting to share what they already know with someone else. So I was just wondering, just out of curiosity, who came in here with a, a preconceived notion, a question? What do you want to learn at a pod camp? Anybody have a hand they want to put up and ask a question of the room right now? I see a hand that almost went up right there, and that's good enough for me. Yes? Well, it's, it's not really specific, but I'm, I'm looking at how to use social media to promote business. How to use social media to promote business. Uh, I'm going to guess that's actually a fairly popular concept here in this room today, uh, because as we've seen over the past couple of years, social media has exploded in terms of marketing. So there's lots of great ways to do it, lots of horrendous ways to do it. We'll tell you all about those all weekend. Some borderline not legal ways that we'll point out that you should never do. Um, now here's another thing. How many people here in this room think they know a thing or two about social media for business? All right, probably a quarter of the room. None of our organizers. <laughs> Don't ask anybody who's actually put the event together. Um, but so as you can see, you've got questions. A lot of folks in this room think they have answers. Don't be afraid to ask anybody in the room anything at any time, unless somebody else is speaking. That's just completely rude. But uh, we're all here to help each other out. And you're going to come in here today thinking you're going to learn a couple things, and think you're going to meet a couple people you were hoping to meet. You're going to walk out with a totally different experience. Podcast, never the same thing twice. Come back tomorrow, totally different. We'll recast everybody. Right. Uh, I'm going to kick it back to Norm, who's going to introduce our uh, major event speaker of the day. I, I won't, I'll, I'll keep his name secret. <laughs> All right, thanks, Justin. Yeah. Thanks, and, and Justin, 
recently moved to Baltimore, so he uh, had to drive back up here last night. So, so thank you for that. Thanks for the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> so next, I want to uh, introduce a special guest. Uh, he's been to PodCamp before, and um, uh, uh, last night I had, was having a drink with him, and I asked him, well, what do you want me to say? How do you want me to introduce you? And he said, eh, you know. Whatever, which I think is incredibly humble, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he didn't really go in, but uh, <laughs> but it's, it was incredibly humble. You know, I, I've seen him uh, a number of times all around town, uh, and we're really thankful that he you know takes the time out uh, of his busy day. He's leaving uh, shortly to go march in a parade in uh, Bloomfield after this, so I want to thank him. But uh, uh, City Councilman Bill Peduto, uh, <laughs> I'd like to welcome you uh, to PodCamp. <laughs> I like the photo. Good morning, campers. <laughs> you know, I, I never write speeches. I always feel that you know the best speech is the one that comes from the heart. And sometimes it really works well, and that usually involves a lot of coffee and a pr proper amount of sleep. So this one's going to be kind of out there a little bit. Um, uh, Norm's right. Uh, this is actually my fourth. I'm, I'm four for four now with PodCamp. I uh, I got pulled into it many years ago when it was first starting. Is that my phone? <laughs> Probably. Uh, by a friend of mine, Lindsay Petros, and I don't even know if Lindsay's here, and then the next year with Roy and uh, Dave Mansueto, and then uh, last time with Justin, John Carmen, and Justine, and um, back here again this year. And the way I'd like to start this is, um, how many people are, are like me having a really bad year in fantasy football? <laughs> All right. You know, so the other day I'm online and I'm trying to figure out uh, a good running back to pick up for my team. And I start looking and, you know, all of a sudden I'm on Yahoo's Fantasy Football League. And I have so many stats that I'm going through that I, I think I could find this guy's high school transcript if I really <laughs> liked it. And it really hit me. How is it that I can be able to pull all this information, more than I even know how to use, to be able to figure out somebody for a Fantasy Football League but if I need a permit to take to get a shelter at a park, I have to go downtown, get a form that's been Xerox so many times it's crooked, <laughs> fill it out and pay by cash or check. And how is it that this type of technology and social media, not to be, you know, just going out and having government use Facebook or Twitter, but how can you make government more like Facebook and Twitter? And I know a lot of people here are, are here for the, the private business and, and their ways of... Uh, promoting their, their own agendas. But I want to be here this morning to try and plant a seed in all of your brains as you go through this today, because this is going to be great. This is, this is a, a mental exercise. The, the next several hours is like going to a masseuse to massage your brain. And I want you to think about this. The printing press was created, and it changed democracy forever. You know, the Renaissance came about through it. Arts and culture were promoted. Uh, it led to the French Revolution, the American Revolution. All of a sudden, information was made available to the people. We are entering into that next great movement for democracy. And there has never been a tool since the invention of the printing press to be able to get information to people as quickly and as available. Just last week, the New York City just dumped all of its information to the people. Everything. They just said, here, you want it, you got it. You know, how many times building inspections been to this one house? How much Albury property is assessed and how much it's owned? How many police calls go out? And then they offered $25,000 to the person that can come up with the best idea how to use it. Now think about that. It's very difficult to find out how my office spent its money. And you have to go downtown and go through a whole bunch of paper. But it's all out there. It's all digital. And it all can be used in such a way that then it can be translated and communicated and put out. So in Pittsburgh, we're going to try a couple of things this year. Uh, there's four initiatives that we're taking this fall. Uh, the one is to create the first mobile app for government in the country. And Priya's here uh, with Yen's Cam. And we did that. We created iBird. And uh, New York City has now followed suit. And they have a mobile app. DC's Boston. They're going to be doing it soon. But we sort of trailblazed on that. And it's really a simple operation. You just point and click, take the shot of the problem. All of a sudden, it's tagged with uh, GPS, goes right to our 311 system, and we're able to see what the problem is. And then you know what else we can do? We can track it. So we're not just having somebody pick up a phone and writing it on a piece of paper. When we see a graffiti tag, 
I should say that quietly in this building. <laughs> um, but we're able to see it in Bloomfield and then in Lawrenceville and then down to the Strip. And we can not only send a crew to clean it, but we can send a detective to follow it. So it becomes more of a proactive government approach. Uh, we're going to be launching within the next month or so something called MyGov365. Uh, where do you go to get your information for government? Why isn't there a one-stop shop to be able to find out what's happening in federal government, state government, local government that makes sense and is easy to use for you? So that you can look just any issue that you're interested in, historic preservation, and then be able to follow what your elected officials are doing on that issue, and then be able to join groups and socially network together in order to change and get involved in making decision changes and policy changes. Uh, we're going to be working to not just cable cast our council meetings, because that's torturous. I don't want anyone to have to sit through three hours of watching a council meeting. But embed it. So again, you can look up Bill Peduto, Forestry, and just like searching for YouTube videos, just find those parts of those council meetings. And then be able to use it on your site. So then you can become empowered to get your friends and your followers to be able to uh, see what's happening on that issue. Again, right now, that you, you don't see it. You see what's broadcast by KDKA in a 15 second little bite of whatever they want to say that side of the issue was. And I'm not picking on KDKA, but any of the TV stations or newspapers. The, the, the availability of all this information and the availability for people to use it is just amazing. And it's, it's really becoming uh, an issue that has been coined e-democracy. Uh, how did I get here? And what am I doing here? Well, I got here by a car. It's parked down in Boulevard of the Outlet. Uh, but no, my, my background is in government and politics, but I've always had this uh, yearning towards technology, even though I'm very bad at it. Um, I, I, uh, was, I don't want to get all Al Gore on you, but um, I, I was the first person to use a computer in a political campaign in Western PA. And it was, you can't believe it, but it was 1989. It took that long. It was an old Osborne. I don't know if anyone's even familiar with the old OS3. Yeah. I got to still have it. <laughs> the old Osborne OS3. I'm afraid to look on eBay because I think it's worth like so much. And it's probably like 50 bucks or something. But, um, and uh, from that, I went down to DC and I worked on building a, with uh, 30 other people from around the country, a national database of 50 different demographics and then voting records over on top of it. And we built this at uh, the precinct level for the entire country. And it became so popular that the Republican Party didn't buy our data. They actually came in and bought our company. <laughs> so and then they offered us all a job in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, if we wanted to stay. And I came back to Pittsburgh. Uh, and I started a company like doing the same thing and helping Democratic uh, candidates and elected officials. And I had a consulting business for a number of years. Got really sick of the political scene, decided to go into government. And uh, met with, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, it's a, uh, it's a big leap. Um, instead of spending your entire time trying to destroy another person, you just destroy yourself. So it's, uh, but the part about government was is that there, there was a, a mayor down in Baltimore named uh, Mayor O'Malley, and he, he created this system called CityStat. You guys ever see like uh, those shows where they'll have the commish or whatever, and they'll be like, light it up and they'll show like all these where all the crimes are that's called crime stat it was started years ago and they O'Malley said hey if we can do that for crime basically uh, look at it and map it out and figure out how to be really proactive why can't we do that for garbage collection and what O'Malley did is created this really great system called city stat and he made it available to the people so you called in and you complained about the garbage not being picked up you went on their website and you could see your complaint on there and he held everyone accountable to make sure that that didn't happen again uh, in Pittsburgh, we didn't do that because we, we were afraid if we showed all the crime stats and everything, well, people wouldn't want to buy houses in the city. Um, but we did bring city stats to the city. And just recently, there's been a, a couple of other initiatives, like I mentioned uh, uh, with iBird. But all of these things, and even the stuff we've done with our political campaign, Justin, uh, John Carmen, who we mentioned, and uh, Justine Azaric, and uh, worked with me a few years ago to create something called Reform Pittsburgh Now. And the idea was to get this political message of reforming government out to more people. And uh, we had fun with it, but the fact was it laid a groundwork for the change that happened this past year where we finally passed campaign finance reform. We passed lobbyist reform. We passed a lot of other reforms that we couldn't even get through the door. And that's really where this, this, this power is. Um, everything that has been discussed before, uh, until really these past couple of years, 
has been how can technology and social networking help to make government more efficient? It's always been called e-government. Uh, it's been used in political campaigns to get someone elected. What I'm offering to you today is the idea of how can we make it to empower democracy? How can we use technology to empower people to have more of a say in their government and to feel more of an in with their government? And um, it's here. It is here right now. Um, one of the other initiatives that we're going to be hopefully doing by the end of this year is sort of following with that New York model, getting as much information out to people and then working with an organization in town to offer scholarships, uh, small ten to $20,000, to be able to create programs and technology that will then be used to make government more accessible to people. Uh, they created this in D.C. last year. They called it Apps for Democracy, but they never connected it directly with their government. They, they basically made it out there and then it sort of floated. Uh, we want to bring it right directly with government. We want to have an Apps for Democracy that actually puts Pittsburgh in the lead. And for those of you who work in technology, what does that mean? It means you get a foothold in this new industry because this industry is going to be a billion dollar industry within two years. And I want to make sure that Pittsburgh is the home of it. And I want to see those companies stay here and expand here. And the kids from CMU that are graduating, not having to go to Silicon Valley or Boston to be a part of this. Mobile technology in the next two years is going to sell more than laptops. And everything is going to be mobile. Why does it have to be that I'll be able to continue to be able to update my fantasy football team, but I still won't be able to get my permit for a park? So that's your challenge. Uh, as you would think about and hear about all these wonderful ideas today, think about how it can also be used to change the world that you live in. Be Gandhi today. Be the change you wish to see in the world. And think about how all of these wonderful ideas that you're going to be sharing can actually make Pittsburgh a better place as well. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I was going to keep the remaining time for just a Q&A, if okay. that's okay, Norm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else marching in the Bloomfield Columbus Day Parade? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm the only person in Pittsburgh. It's always nice when you're the only person <laughs> in a certain city that's doing these two different events. When is it? In an hour. In an oh. Hour. <laughs> yeah, one hour. Hi, Bill. I Hi. think this is the third time I've seen you in like three days. Um, I'm Natalia Rudiak. I will soon be working with Bill on City Council starting in January. I was just, uh, well, I will be elected to City Council. I'm actually I'm contested on November 3rd. So, um, And one of the questions as you, as you talk about all of these things, and I mean, I think this is a discussion that we need to have as a city, is um, the neighborhood that I will be representing is a pretty working class neighborhood. Um, so how do we ensure that everybody's sort of pulled together on the same page when we start talking about all of these applications like Iberg? And, I, I, I think it's a really good question. I, I, uh, I met with the Apple folks about where people have or are using iPhones. And it cuts across the entire, not just the city, but all the different demographics. Uh, how, uh, not to be put anyone in a bad situation or embarrassing, but how many people in this room make over 100000 a year? Few. Um, how many people in this room are under the age of 25? Very few. How many people in this room are women? Yeah. <laughs> See, the demographics that people think about with technology, it's a bunch of rich guys from Shady Side. The truth of the matter is it's everywhere. And, and the, the fact is we can continue to play down and the rest of the world will pass us. Uh, time and technology only go in one direction. And I want to help to push us forward. That being said, there's still opportunities for those that aren't part of the digital era. Um, there, and there needs to be uh, really an, an emphasis made in it. Pittsburgh is a really bad city for Wi-Fi. Uh, many people may have realized that. A lot of hills and a lot of, th but it's really created very well for WiMAX. And there are stimulus grants that are coming available in round two that could allow Pittsburgh to have a WiMAX system where our entire city is, is wireless and at a pretty good speed, too. Um, we need to pursue that and tell you together. And if we did that, um, there will be a lot more applications like Priya and other companies that will be booming here, but we'll also be able to use community centers and other places for an opportunity for everyone to be able to get online. Yeah. 
Mike. Because we're on the next <laughs> as well. Yeah, the, the question I have for you is the things that you're describing are wonderful, but they presuppose that, frankly, government wants to be that transparent. Right. Um, <laughs> pardon, pardon my cynicism. No. I live it. I know. <laughs> I, I, I've been here. Uh, but, yeah, but the point I'm making is, I mean, if if we've learned anything over the course of the past couple of weeks, it's that Pittsburgh government doesn't necessarily want to hear the people who live in Pittsburgh. Um, what's the reception to all of this over on Grant Street? It's, um, and I, I don't want to speak out of turn to speak for anybody, but it's, it's the importance of getting people like Natalia elected. Uh, it's the importance of getting people like Daniel Lavelle elected. Uh, people that have an understanding and a willingness to be an open, transparent government, uh, it, it comes down to the power of the people. If I could put this back onto you, it's this is what I'm asking. When you're listening and hearing all these wonderful ideas today about how you're going to be able to get your message out to a bigger audience and how to t get that message uh, uh, home, uh, that needs to have a democratic process to it. Uh, if we can use technology to get more people engaged in government, more people will turn out to vote. There were 145,000 people that voted in the presidential election in the city of Pittsburgh, and there were 45,000 people that voted in the mayor's race. Um, when you have that big of a disconnect between the people and their <coughs> local government, local government will elect people who won't really care what people think. Uh, it's about getting people engaged back. Yes? How much of that that disconnect and how much of those numbers has to do with the fact that, frankly, if Pittsburgh were not a one-party town, uh, people might believe that it makes a damn bit of difference. You know, and I've heard that argument before. The question was how much of that disconnects because Pittsburgh's a one-party town? <laughs> Um, you can ask Jim Motznick if he feels that we're in the same party. <laughs> and he and I and those that follow politics, and by the way, there are a lot of people in this room who I follow. So I just wanted to say, hi, I follow you. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Uh, but there, there is more diversity within the nine people on the city council. And we, we, we tend to caucus, you know, work together. But even the ones that I, we work with on a certain issue, we may not work with. Um, I, I don't really see that as being the, the real issue. I think that government has placed a firewall between itself and people, uh, and I think that we have an opportunity to tear that firewall down. Hi, Bill. I follow hey. you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a real way. Um, <laughs> there is no stalking in this. Um, this just brings to mind to me what just happened with the Carnegie Libraries because it seems to me that what is kind of representative of the old style of communicating and where you get your information is such a critical partner in getting from the point where this group of people are online to where the entire community is online. That's where a lot of people go just to get on the computer. Families that can't afford it and I hear what you're saying about what will happen but it seems like we need as a the people on the forefront need to look back and remember to bring the libraries along with us yeah. and try to make sure that you don't have to take three buses. That's going to be even more of a discouragement to stay on the opposite side of the firewall, so to speak. And um, I don't know if you have any comment on that. I assume you're pro-library, but just that some of those old institutions play a really important role in getting us into the new era. It, and I think part of it, too, is um, it's just with the libraries as an example, in case people didn't know, if you're from out of town, Pittsburgh just announced that it's going to be closing down a number of its libraries because of financial reasons. Um, it's getting that information out. It's, it's the libraries need to show the budget and to show where the shortfall is and to show where the revenues are coming from so that people then can make their, their own decisions. You'll win people's minds and people's hearts. What's different about this technology and why, you know, I had this argument with an AP reporter. He wanted to say that Iberg is nothing new. You know, we have cable TV to show. You know, what the, what's the, new, the the newness of this? Is it's a two-way street. It has the ability for people to communicate back to their government, not just watch it on on a cable TV broadcast. And that's where the libraries need to be, and where the city government needs to be as well. We're not we're not responding back. Pri is going to talk about Iberg later today. I hope you guys get a chance to to really learn about it. 
Uh, it's only in phase one. I mean, and, and the and the build outs will be much beyond just going to every uh, type of phone, every type of platform. It will be the ability for <coughs> you to tell us what issues you care about. So if you say your issues are urban forestry and Brookline, you'll get an update to say, hey, city to vote on cutting $200,000 out of its urban forest budget, or Brookline Citizens Council to meet tonight at wherever. Uh, and so that that two-way communication can start to happen. Think of it as like a, a, a reverse 911. Uh, that's where government needs to be at. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I just wanted to speak to uh, the two-way communication versus one-way communication. Um, I think that 311 has been good for the city. I think that expanding it in terms of Iberg is really good for the city as well. And it gets more people the opportunity to uh, contribute those problems about the city. But uh, it's it's still one way to me. And I'm still, I still don't ever see the feedback. You have to, if you have a problem, it, you, you submit it, and you don't ever get anything back about it. Call back, maybe you'll get an update. But generally, the update is we'll send it back on Right. And that's really where the goal of Iberg is to go into. Uh, we wanted to beat Boston. We, we kind of viewed it as a space race. <laughs> and uh, it was really important to be first. Um, and so the applications that were created by Pri and her team at CMU uh, basically took what is available in our 311 system and made it available in a mobile application. But it's always been the goal of. Um, of the team to try to put together something that was completely different, so that it was proactive, so that you could have just a couple keywords that once we keyword in, and maybe it's even with, and eventually all this stuff sort of like rivers flows together to a certain point, that it also goes to the point where the embedded video also is be able to be downloaded to you. Um, being proactive on that side, is it's gonna happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. It may be next year that some city gets really proactive and invests in it, or it could be within the next three to five years. But um, it's never had the potential, at least not in the 20 years that I've been working in this business, uh, to affect the way that democracy occurs, the way that people get involved with their government as it is right now. Uh, it's pretty exciting. And um, it's rather exciting, too. I, I just realized, Norm, I, I knew I saw that photo before. That was from the old pit girl. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time and if we can harness this and it's going to be a challenge because governments will want to keep doors closed uh, but if we can harness it and use that information you're going to be able to empower people and once you empower people anything is possible even healthcare reform <laughs> right. thanks All right.